At Garden Masterclass, we do a regular, every week, Thursday interview or presentation with a leading person from the garden or landscape or indeed wider botanical world. Uh, and these recordings go to this YouTube channel. Uh, we have great fun doing this. It's something we started during the, the COVID year and we saw it as an important uh, public service and we've continued to, to do it for free and all our presenters do it for free. Uh, now, the best uh, or most popular of these recordings, um, we, after a few months of being on YouTube, we put them on into our members' archive so that you can only see the full uh, recording if you are a member of Garden Masterclass. Uh, so we've got probably about 200 hours of these now on the website, which is accessible to, to members, uh, as well as lots of other material, uh, all the webinars, of course, which anyone can see, but uh, for members there's the advantage that they get 50% uh, off all of our webinar recordings. Uh, membership of Garden Masterclass uh, also entitles you to various other discounts, uh, to podcasts, which uh, non-members can't access, uh, and various other special deals which we'll come up with from now and again. Uh, so, and of course, it's also a chance to join a truly global community of garden and landscape people. So do please come and join us um, and you can see some more uh, of these recordings. Uh, the first excerpt we've got for you in this uh, taster is with Ben O'Brien, who is a garden designer in Ontario, Canada. And he's one of several practitioners who's working with using low fertility substrates and getting really good results, uh, in this case with uh, nearly all with uh, native North American species. Uh, ben is a great young up-and-coming uh, uh, designer, plants person, and uh, we expect he'll go far. So it was really great to uh, have him talk about uh, his work. Uh, and of course, you can see the full recording uh, if you join Garden Masterclass. So this is one of the first gravel gardens I've done. And the, and the really exciting thing I find is because the gravel is a, a more stressful environment, you can pack plants much more tightly together, which means you get these really dramatic seasonal um, seasonal changes over the course of a year because you can simply have more species per square meter in these gravel gardens. So on May 23rd, we have prairie smoke and some of the tulips, uh, the Thalia daffodils. Cecilaria hoofleriana is one of the really nice early flowering um, grasses in this garden. Less than a month later, it looks like this. There's Monarda bradburiana, different alliums. Uh, the prairie smoke in the foreground is now doing its smoking thing after it's flowered. Just a few days after that, the penstemon calicosis is in bloom. The orange butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa is starting to flower. Um, I was able to get a hold of Echinacea simulata, which is very similar to Echinacea pallida, but um, was a slightly different species. I actually got some of these plants from Kurt Blumel in, in Virginia, so that was a, a, nice, a nice connection to be able to introduce some of these less common native species. Our next recording here is with Bettina Jaugstetter, who was the principal designer for this year's German Federal Garden Show. Well, perhaps I should say last year, actually, it was 2023. Uh, which, like a lot of these German garden shows, uh, is basically about regeneration. It was an old military site, uh, really, really poor soil quality. Uh, so Bettina was uh, using really tough, uh, drought-tolerant uh, plant species uh, that don't require particularly high nutrient levels uh, and would grow in the very poor quality substrate beneath uh, this uh, concrete apron of what was once upon a time an American military base. Bettina is uh, a hugely experienced and very inventive uh, designer. She's hugely enthusiastic about her work. Um, and so in this presentation, uh, we had her talking about the plant selection she, she made for this very tough site as well as introducing us to these extraordinary annual plantings uh, she did, which are uh, you know, very much a, 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 a one summer event, uh, more conventional in their demands perhaps for water and fertility, you know, a real public showpiece, but working with an extraordinary range of plants with some very, very inventive ways of bringing them together. Bettina, quite honestly, is one of the most sophisticated people around in planting design. Her work is 
quite incredible. Uh, and uh, every now and again we do a webinar with her because she's got an awful lot uh, to communicate. So uh, here's Bettina And Young. the major thing is, is this uh, steeper, which takes two, up to two or three years to be really evolved, yeah. mm, mm, uh, mm. best to have the best uh, uh, show, to make the best show. And uh, one very famous plant of mine is Euphorbia sequariana nitsitsiana, uh, which are also used in all models. Mm -hmm. You see we are in blue, but I used it also in blue and I used it in yellow. And uh, so, uh, by the way, Euphorbia sequariana is native to an um, um, inside dune, which is next to the Buga. Oh really? So it's oh, really, really? Oh, it's a real next local to the plant. Buka, yes. yes, these are inland sand dunes. Yes, on, on exactly. The, on, on the right in the e Rhine e Valley. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Gosh, Very wow. close to the Buga. Yeah. And uh, I, g I gave also a companion uh, grass. Like in this case, it's Mulimbergia. Uh, in another case, like here, it's mm. Helictotrichon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, for many of us, uh, one of the great garden and landscape designers of the 20th century was the Dutch lady Mien Huis, who really dominated the field uh, in the Netherlands for much of the 20th century. Uh, until recently there has been really frustrating almost nothing about her in, in, in English and so all these designers and plants people have been going over to Holland seeing examples of her work or her extraordinary experimental garden out in the east of the country and not really being able to find out much about her. So we were very glad to get Julia Crawford, who has written the first book about Mienhaus uh, in English. It's beautifully, beautifully illustrated. Uh, her husband is a professional photographer and has a drone, which is a great advantage in looking at Mien's very ge often very geometrical work. So this is an excerpt uh, from that uh, particular uh, recording with Julia Crawford. And then um, she also used a combination of circles and squares occasionally. So this is the, the herb garden, um, which is actually a bit of an atypical garden for her. It's quite formal. Um, and funnily enough, um, again, I, you know, as, a, a, as an aside, as when I was doing my research, um, it was done as a bit of a joke, actually, because um, she kept people kept saying to her, oh, you really should design a herb garden. You really should design a herb garden. And so she um, she ended up sort of doing it as a as a as a little bit of a, of a joke, um, just to sort of placate these people and, and you know, say that she'd done well. It does jump around. And um, so again, May, um, June uh, and then into September. Uh, still got some of that color, Rebecca and, and things like that. The grasses, obviously, um, really coming through then and then into October again. And I think, you know, you can really see the importance of those evergreen, um, you know, hedges that hold that structure um, sort of at those sort of early and later parts of the year. And then just some details from the garden, because you know, it's always nice to look at plants, isn't it? Uh, the next excerpt is with one of our favourite interviewees, uh, Michael McCoy from Australia. Michael uh, has uh, worked indeed in the past at Great Dixter. He's a terrific gardener, he's a professional TV presenter, and he's really, really articulate in talking about garden design. So it was great to, to talk to him about his new book on uh, recent Australian garden design. So here are a couple of excerpts uh, from that presentation and interview. You okay, you can't argue with that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the other thing is you can be discerning at times without being genuinely critical. And in the very first episode, early on in the, um, in the, the construction of this garden, I made the point that I didn't think they were going to reach a balance of greenery and growth with the hard graveled surfaces i felt like I, I i put this as a challenge going i really don't know this is going to make it and i didn't mention it again in the show but later on a week or so later a friend of mine who saw it on screen said saw it on tv said you were right you know they'd never got the balance right and i said i, I never said that and she said no but you empowered us with the capability to see for ourselves 
that they right. didn't achieve. And right. they've got these holes in the side that they're used to clamp and to lift. Mm -hmm. And so he made, uh, they're, they're nearly a metre deep. So your planting is a very long way back from the front edge, you know. Yeah. But yeah. Um, he used these to create these retaining walls at a fraction of the price um, right. yeah. of, of if he'd had to use any other the material and and i love that i think i've got some photos just love these little shadow lines of mm. the of the clamping holes in the side mm. um and then uh the designer went to great effort to use plants that sort of captured some of that of that that's a strobilanthus strobilanthus gossipinus there mm. with an incredible silvery leaf with this sort of coppery overlay so it mixes in with the rusty materials he used as used and the um and the concrete blocks and we've oh, interestingly we've also um it's a lovely offset against the the um, the moral imperatives around growing native plants um, is the understanding that occurred. I mean, I live right at the base of um, a mountain, Mount Macedon, just outside of Melbourne. It burnt out in 1983 very dramatically. Mm -hmm. And the, the single biggest um, retardant or the most effective retardant of fire in this hugely i mean it was 100 kilometers an hour wind and ridiculously like zero um humidity oh, and um it, it was the oak trees the old oak trees on mount mass and saved the houses that were to the south to the um yes to the northeast of and in this series of excerpts from some of our recordings made over the past year we're ending up in the american midwest with roy diblick who has been a real uh, veteran plants person uh, a real pioneer in the nursery trade growing native plants uh, he's a hugely experienced both in growing them commercially but also using them uh, in, in planting design and he's worked with pete aldolf on several projects including the lurie garden in chicago uh, this is the story of his uh, professional life. Um, Roy is, is a wonderful character with a very sort of mellow, uh, laid-back way of, of, of talking about the many challenges uh, he has, uh, has faced in, in, in his life. So it was really lovely to finally pin down Roy uh, for this great discussion of his career um, growing plants, uh, growing perennials uh, in the American Midwest. We bought some bare root plants in from uh, Walter's Gardens was around then and still are very successful. And we put them in about, well, we potted about 200 plants and we put them in the back of the potting shed on plywood on, on top of some plywood. We put the plywood on some uh, house bricks. So it was off the ground. So the following, we covered them with white plastic, like nurse, we saw nurseries, you know, white plastic must do something or these nurseries wouldn't be, we didn't know what it did. We just covered the plants with it. And in the next winter, I took the plastic off. Every plant was dead. Every one of them. So, well, what, what did we do wrong? So I went to Midwest Ground Covers. That's a large nursery here in the Midwest, Peter Arm Nursery. And I went and I asked Peter, I said, Peter, we potted up 200 plants. What did we do wrong? He says, well, what kind of soil did you use? I guess I went out to the field. I dug soil in a wheelbarrow and I potted everything in field soil. He and Gary bust out laughing at me. He go, Roy, Roy, you made house bricks. You, were, you don't use plain soil. So we had a good conversation and uh, talked about the park, the plan, the program, the quality of the plants they need, he needed, uh, no substitution policy, whatever he has in his plan he needs to have. I said, yeah, I can do that because we got – two, three years. There was no immediacy for this project because they haven't raised the money yet. And the, the key was the endowment. Uh, John Bryan and uh, Ed Euler, especially Ed Euler, they weren't going to put the garden in until they had the endowment to care for it. So that garden may still not be in if no one came up with the $10 million. So Mrs. Lurie, she, she bless her heart, gave $10 million to care for that garden, that garden itself. And no one can have any decisions about what to do there except the gardeners. So remember, if you want to see the full version of any of these recordings, you need to become a member of Garden Masterclass. Uh, we're a hugely welcoming community. We put on lots of really interesting stuff. Uh, we reach the parts that um, other garden media simply doesn't reach. And uh, we believe that being a member, we will find very rewarding, especially for those uh, 
darker or wetter evenings when you're stuck indoors and can't get outside, uh, we've got a huge amount of, of material to share with you. So do please come and join us.